and we're live. Good evening, welcome to our special meeting of Municipal Council for Tuesday, June 13th, 2023. Uh, the Town of East Gwilmbury Council Chambers is where we are this evening. I'd like to call the meeting to order and ask if there's any declarations of interest. Seeing none, I will include the There we go, thank you very much. The land acknowledgement statement. The town of East Gwillimbury recognizes and acknowledges the lands originally used and occupied by the first peoples of the Williams Treaty First Nation and other indigenous peoples. And on behalf of council, I thank them for sharing this land. We also acknowledge the Chippewas of Georgina Island First Nation as East Gwillimbury's closest First Nation community and recognize the unique relationship the Chippewas have with the lands and the waters of this territory. They are the water protectors and environmental stewards of these lands and we join them in these responsibilities. Item D is deputations and this evening we have no deputations. Uh, we are in a workshop and I will um, pass this along to uh, Mr. Velchek to provide an introduction. Thank you, Madam Mayor. So this evening we're um, pleased to um, provide a presentation regard from our um, ECSS uh, team. And so uh, our fire chief, Rob McKenzie, uh, and his team are going to provide uh, what we hope will be a really informative session regarding emergency services. Uh, we certainly encourage um, questions and dialogue if we can, because we know this is an area of uh, significant uh, public interest, and we want to make sure that the public's um, got a good understanding of um, of uh, what we do, how we prioritize uh, service delivery to ensure that um, we keep our community safe. Uh, so, uh, with that, Madam Mayor, I'm just going to turn it over to Chief McKenzie, with your permission. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mark, and uh, thank you, Your Honor, and uh, members of Council. <clears throat> I'm happy to be providing uh, the presentation for tonight's workshop um, and, the, uh, and the opportunity to focus solely on ECSS. Uh, the goal of this workshop is to provide you with uh, information, data, and a clearer understanding of ECSS's operations. I started four years ago and haven't had the opportunity to get in front of you in this format, so I'm happy to be here and, and able to talk about the operation and I brought some of the, the key people with me on our team. So there's several topics that we're going to cover tonight, uh, including the management function, uh, consistent and accurate data that we collect um, so that it helps us make evidence-based decisions as we go along. Um, I'm also, uh, I've provided you with some visual aids today, so we're going to talk about the, uh, the chart that's in front of you and there might be, there might even be a movie or two that we're going to watch. So. Uh, <laughs> Hopefully, uh, we get some information out of this. So, uh, next slide, please. You can see from the agenda tonight that we're going to cover a number of areas. And joining me tonight are, are the key people that I work with every day that help me manage the, the ECSS operations. Uh, Nicole Sprague, our uh, education specialist, she couldn't be here tonight. Uh, we were, I was hoping to put her in front of you uh, because she's doing some fantastic work, but she's actually attending a two-day summit at the uh, Ontario Fire Marshal's office called uh, Operation Safer, which is smoke alarms for every residence. Um, last year, 133 people died in fires in Ontario. The fire marshal's upset, the fire chiefs are upset, so they're, they're, they've, they've, they've convened this two-day summit to try to determine you know, what's, what we're doing wrong and what, how can we change things. So Nicole's representing um, EG and ECSS today and tomorrow down there. I had uh, lined up Brittany Kostoff, who is our uh, fire protection advisor with the fire marshal's office. She was gonna come and talk about our, our relationship, our connection with the fire marshal's office, but she got called away to the same summit, so we're down to <laughs> Actually, we're down three. Laura James, uh, you remember Laura James from York Region Emergency Management. She was going to come here tonight and, and talk about emergency <laughs> management, but she, she moved on. And uh, anyway, Emily Mason is going to fill her shoes uh, quite uh, sufficiently. And uh, anyway, Laura, J Laura James moved on, and I got word today that uh, they've, um, the region has secured a, another manager for us, and we'll, we'll find out about that in the next week or so. 
Um, Emily Mason is our emergency services and bylaw coordinator. Um, she works closely with me as the CMC when we deal with um, the region and the province uh, as, from an emergency uh, management perspective. So she's going to, you know, walk you through some of that just to remind us what we're doing, why we do it, and, and what your role is in, uh, in, an, in a larger scale emergency. Um, our high flying captain, Shauna Davidson, is going to talk about the fantastic things that her team is doing in uh, community education as well as uh, the vital work in uh, prevention and inspections, plus plans examining. Um, like Andres, um, I can't hold up two building codes, but I can only hold up one fire code. Um, Shauna, Andres's Bible is his um, building code and, and Shauna's is the FPPA and the fire code. So where Andres and his team um, make sure that all the buildings in this town are built to this high standard, uh, what Sean and her team do is they make sure that once the, it's built and it, w it, people occupy it, then it's maintained. That's sort of the her function. Um, joining us tonight too is Assistant Deputy Durstroff, who's going to bring his previous um, experience as a police officer, a firefighter, and a fire investigator for the fire marshal's office to talk about our connection and relationship with the fire marshal's office, as well as some insight into uh, operating and maintaining the fire service. One person that uh, couldn't be with us tonight, but wishes he was, is D uh, Deputy Ryan Jago. He's a key player on our management team. Not able to make it today, but he wishes he could be here, so we'll see him shortly. Uh, Ryan, Rick, and I have, uh, we bring several years of experience to ECSS management team, <clears throat> and we're committed to the safety of this community. Next slide, please. Now, last week I heard at a council session we were talking about, or the, the discussion was about um, development services, and I heard the term um, uh, trans transitioning from uh, rural to urban, as, as you talked about the growth of this, this community. And the same thing um, occurs with the fire service. Um, in East Goulombary, the fire service started out as purely a volunteer service, and over the years, over the decades, it transitioned to a composite model where there were some full-time um, employees and I'm thinking there was a chief and then there was an inspector and then at some point we hire, started hiring full-time firefighters but at the heart of it we still have the the volunteer that's transitioned to a paid on call where they get paid to come to calls to training to pub ed events so we've, we've shown oh there it is there the old picture I've also put the org chart on there uh, just to show some of the depth, uh, um, we talk a lot of times about our full-time staff being at, at 20, and, but we forget sometimes about the depth that we have with our paid on call staff. We currently have 65 paid on call firefighters. So I just, I, I, I included that up there with the numbers just to show you that we have, you know, three managers with the support of Emily. We've got four community and education people. We've got a new hire in the uh, training division, the education development officer, and we have 20 full-time firefighters and 65 uh, paid on call currently. The composite model is an efficient and cost-effective method of providing fire service to this town. There's a solid core of well-trained full-time firefighters out of the central station of Queensville that are supported by equally trained paid on call firefighters. The firefighters respond to various emergency and non-emergency incidents, and they also support the community by, by in the prevention and with the prevention division out in the community. Sorry. Uh, next slide, please. I wonder, if, wonder if we recognize anybody in there. <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> So our composite department recently completed a year-long project that was tied to the municipal modernization program. Uh, the, the goal was to try to find efficiencies and, and efficiencies of the two services and uh, potential consolidation with us and the Georgina Fire Department. Although the final report determined that consolidation was not a viable, viable option, it did make recommendations to investigate shared services for the two departments. You'll remember there were nine categories, eight or nine categories for shared services automatic aid, fire prevention and training, fleet services, procurement, training, special teams, emergency management, 
those are those are areas where the chief and Georgina and myself have already started discussions. We've already investigated, and I think it's um, I'm due for a report back in Q4 as to the progress on that. The project at that time also refreshed the fire master plan that provided recommendations for ECSS and moving forward over the next several years. Some of the recommendations talked about monitoring department's overall performance, establishing standards for when service models should be addressed, and a framework for departmental growth appropriate for the composite department. And in addition, uh, the fire prevention officer, Shauna, is working on the, C the community risk assessment, or CRA. So these, these items and these things are, are, we're gonna take into account over the next few months, and that's gonna determine, um, hopefully, uh, the framework for when we transition to larger and larger. Next slide, please. A bit more about the composite department. Composite fire departments are those that have a mix of career firefighters and paid on call or volunteer firefighters. A composite department is not a lower grade or lesser value department. It's not a C team compared to an A team. It's the exact same thing. Same apparatus, same equipment, same training qualifications and standards for the same responses. The only difference a composite department will, will have is a slower response to assemble crews on an emergency scene. In Ontario, there are 437 fire departments, 32 are career, 195 are strictly volunteer, and 210 are composite. In York Region, there are full, four, four full-time departments and four uh, departments that are either volunteer or composite. Before I pass it over to Deputy Deerstroff, I'm happy to answer any questions to this point. Thank you very much, Chief. Questions? I'm not seeing any yet, but they may come back later. Thank you. <clears throat> I'm not Brit Brittany Kostoff. <laughs> so I will try and uh, cover her role. Um, she's a great asset to us. We have a great working relationship with her. And she has provided us with some uh, training sessions to our officers uh, at our officer development session nights. Uh, it would have been nice to have her here to get an unbiased uh, opinion on how we uh, stack up against the rest of the uh, areas that she has covered, and she's got quite a drastic area that uh, she has to cover off. Uh, I'll switch to the next slide, please. Ne next slide, please, yes. And what Brittany was going to cover off is the Office of the Fire Marshal's mandate as far as uh, protection, fire protection services. And that comes in the, in the uh, form of the three lines of defense. This came out about uh, 12, 13 years ago, and they determined that this was the best approach uh, for fire safety throughout the province. And it starts with uh, public fire safety education as the number one and most important first line of defense, followed by fire safety inspections and enforcement, and lastly, emergency response. And they're in that order for a reason, because we want to try and prevent incidents from occurring. And that's how we're going to save lives. We want to be ahead of it. It's much more cost efficient. It's much safer for the community. And it's just a better way of doing business. Line one deals with how we deal with it in EG. We have a robust program where we have public service announcements, uh, distribution of public education materials, uh, numerous presentations, uh, targeted campaigns, as well as all public events that we can attend. We have a very in-depth smoke alarm program, uh, including fire escape planning. We are actively engaged with Twitter. We're getting better and better at that all the time. That's a, a new thing for us. And Nicole Sprague is doing an excellent job at uh, maintaining that in cooperation with our, our comm staff as well. Uh, line two is fire safety standards and enforcement. Again, we have a great team uh, managing that area. And how we differ from other areas is we don't just go by the minimum standard in the fire code, which is complaint or request. We actually have a proactive approach where we schedule inspections. 
And this is a great way to get people to comply with the legislation because the fire code is a compliance legislation. We want people to follow the law. We don't want to go out there and lay charges if we don't have to. That's our last resort. So we want them to comply. So sometimes we'll give them more time to get things up to fire code compliance or come up with different alternatives for them. And the last line is line three, emergency response. And this is to lessen the impact of, of fires. And we have the capability of suppression, rescue, uh, but just to, again, emphasize our staff is our staff are all trained to the same standard. Uh, there are standards that are required uh, by the Office of the Fire Marshal, and we meet and exceed those standards. Um, and all of our, our staff are well-trained and prepared to respond. Uh, but what's really awesome about EG, and why I came here and why I'm so attracted to coming here, is that all the lines work together. All our sections work together. Uh, just because they're suppression staff doesn't mean that they just go to fire calls and medical emergencies. There are eyes and ears out in the community. They go to these calls. Uh, it could be a burning complaint. They relay that information to our prevention staff, and then we follow up with it. Um, they see a hoarding uh, situation, for example. They take photographs. They notify me, and, and we follow up from that. So it's a, a great team approach, and it works really, really well and efficient. And how it differs, differs from the rest of the fire departments and fire services throughout the provinces, the three lines are, are not equal. The three lines, in order for them to work, they have to support each other. It's, just, it's kind of like a tripod. If you have one leg that's not attached properly, it's just going to fall over. So the first line is public education. In, in, for the majority of the province, that line is just broken. It's limited resources, limited funding, not a lot of effort and time put into it. The second line is a, a very thin single line where there are inspectors but not a lot of resources and not a lot of money put into it. And all, the, the last line is that big mammoth, is the big bar, you know, the huge one where you have a ton of staff, a ton of money, uh, a ton of resources going into it. But that's the last line of defense. So we're missing out on opportunities in the first two lines. Once that fire truck goes down the road, we've missed an opportunity. So as a, as a whole, we have to look at our ability as a fire service to reduce the amount of fire-related incidents. That's how we test ourselves and prove that we're doing a good job. Both EG and the OFM focuses on the proactive approach with education and public on early at detection and escape. As a whole, prioritizing in this order is the best for the community. Next page, please. During my years with the Office of the Fire Marshal, I had an opportunity to testify at the uh, EG and Whitby uh, fatal fire inquest. It was during this time where I presented this graph. Um, it wasn't, it was the first time it was really seen by a lot of people and uh, it was almost a silence in the courtroom because people believe that rescue is always going to happen, right? And that's not the reality. The, the reality is no matter how fast the fire service gets there, it may not be in time. So the whole emphasis on this inquest was the importance of fire education, fire safety education, and inspections and enforcement. Early notification is the number one thing you need, and that's in the form of a working smoke alarm. If you don't have a working smoke alarm, this graph, you're already behind because that detection portion in the first two minutes, minute and a half, is gone. So the time, time starts ticking as soon as that fire starts. Then you have the notification of the smoke alarm, hopefully, if you have one. If you don't have that now, we're already in deep trouble. By the time the fire gets notified and there's a 911 call to dispatch, then it, the 
fire department has to get dispatched. Then they have the dispatch time, travel time, and then once they get to the scene, they still have to set up. Once all of that happens, we're already into a bad environment. And it doesn't have to necessarily be fire. It's 90% it's of the time it's smoke inhalation, which causes the death. So today with the, the building materials that are being used, it's all synthetic, man-made stuff. So it's toxic smoke and it's not survivable. So the emphasis is on early detection and getting out and staying out. This is good for everybody. It's good for the community. It's good for the firefighters because it is a firefighter safety to the best degree because if everyone's waiting out in the front lawn when the fire service arrives, that makes our firefighters job much safer because they don't have to go in. They don't have to risk themselves to go in. They can just protect the exposures and put out the fire. The other thing that came out of this inquest was uh, there was a fire in Whitby where three uh, young people died in a, in a house. And there was a full-time fire station 260 meters down the road. And it was fully full-time career staffed, best fire equipment, brand new station. And in this circumstance, the, if you look at the zero where the fire actually started, they witnessed the fire. So there's no delay. So this is the, is the best case scenario for being able to, uh, to initiate 911 and get emergency services responding when it's actually witnessed. There was no delay in that. So they made the call, and even though they made the call 260 meters away, a, a minute and a half response time, set up and everything, all three of them perished in the fire. So that stressed the importance of home escape planning. You have to get out. People have to take fire safety seriously, and that comes from teaching them and educating them. And it, all along the road, from young to middle age to old, it's a responsibility across the board. We used to have a timeline of between four to five minutes to get out of a structure. Now they're saying you have a minute or less. They're just burning so quickly, so it's so important for people to get out. The Howard Avenue fire inquest. That was another highlight of no working smoke alarm. That's just the reality. If there was a working smoke alarm, we probably wouldn't be talking about this. So. I don't know how, it, you know, you keep hearing, I just heard a press release in Brampton for another double fatality and the same thing. There weren't working smoke alarms. This has to get done. And the way we're gonna get this done is by going door to door and making sure people are in compliance. And we're gonna track it and we're gonna keep going until we get everybody. It's the only way to do it. In 2012, there were 69 fire deaths in Ontario. 2021, 121. In 2022, 133 fire deaths. It's the highest in 20 years. It's unacceptable. In today's, with today's technology, you think of, I'm sure we all have experienced a false smoke alarm going off, either blowing out a candle, taking a shower, opening up the oven door, or burning toast. There's no fire, there's no emergency there. These things are very precise and go off. They're very accurate. They go off very early stages. If we have smoke alarms, there should be no reason why people can't escape from their structures. And I'm willing to take any questions in regards to that section at this time. Thank you. Questions? Go ahead, please. Uh, through you, Madam Mayor, I'm just part of my ignorance on the, like from, from building code, I remember the, the discussions about, at one point on new builds on homes, uh, folks talked about sprinkler implementation and then, um, but is there is there a building code to have uh, smoke um, 
uh, smoke alarms be hardwired? Is that ever a discussion as opposed to battery? Like, is that a building code thing? The new, that the new building code, yes, absolutely. So the new building code deals with, sorry, the building code deals with new construction. So what happens now in new, new homes, you're going to get even a higher level of protection. All the smoke alarms are gonna be interconnected. They're usually gonna be carbon monoxide as well capable, so it'll be a combination. It'll have a strobe, and you'll also have them, in addition to having them on all floors and outside all sleeping areas, you also have them in all bedrooms. So it is, it is great to have that uh, in the building code. However, we deal with the fire code, right? It's, we're existing structures now. So some of the homes we go in, they may not be required to have that if they weren't built in the last 10 years, for example. Just in follow-up, so just it is 10 years. So it was 2013 that that became. A, what is the what, what the, was that? The date, I'm not sure. I'm I'm throwing it out there. It was about 10, 12 years ago where that came out that they installed them in the bedrooms. So what we do as as a public education is if for for extra protection, we recommend you put some in your bedrooms as well. If you have a larger house with wings, for example, we suggest maybe putting up two in each in on each side of the wing just to increase uh, your safety. Go ahead, please. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, through you to our presenter, thank you uh, for this. And this is a very interesting chart that you're sharing. Um, <clears throat> when I was in the insurance industry, we had um, probably, probably in a year, any given year, we'd have about three what we call total losses. Um, per 100,000 policies. So not, you know, that was, that was pretty good, uh, you know, from a risk standpoint. I was just curious, at what time, this, this, this chart spans 10 minutes, at what, at what time would you suggest that it's, we're entering into the total loss phase where the, 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 the dwelling is unrecoverable? Probably 10 minutes. Yeah. It's, it, it gets so full of smoke and then there's gonna be water damage from us doing suppression activities. It, most of the time it's gonna be a, a total loss. I mean, they may be able to save the foundation, but in general, you know, if we don't get there early and it wasn't uh, detected quick and the phone call didn't get, there was a delay in the detection, uh, you know what, that's just, you can argue that though too. It depends on the size of the house too, what kind of structure, the different building materials. There's a lot of variables that go in there. So, but it's most of the time, if you've got smoke damage, they're just gonna replace it down to the studs if, if yeah. the studs are still capable of being saved. But once it gets into the roof and things like that, it's yeah. usually. Yeah. That's, that's yeah. mind boggling that it only takes 10 minutes. Yeah. And it's not a very long nope. period it's not of time. very long. Uh, maybe I'll put it into perspective like this. What I did was I did a, uh, a two exact rooms uh, video. Um, so one room was with old uh, furnishings. So uh, from natural furnishings. And then the new one was all synthetic man-made furnishings. So modern furnishings, right? Cheap foams, polyurethane foam, that type of stuff. And we lit the fire basically in the same locations and just let them burn and we had the time going. And the one with the synthetic, within four minutes, it was a flashover, just one room, flashover. And the one in, in, in the old original furnishings was just a little fire that you could put up with an extinguisher. Wow. Yeah. And it's yeah. on the internet if you wanna take a look That's at that. That's crazy. But we haven't got time for all these videos. No. But I do have one for you. <laughs> okay, just one last, one last question. The, uh, the date on this chart is from 2001. Mm -hmm. So I know some stats never change over time. Is this, is this it's still very relevant? Aver averages, again, mm -hmm. you know, there's gonna be some areas, um, you know, as you go further north, you have volunteer only uh, yeah. services. So their response time is gonna be a little greater. Uh, and in Toronto, you can have response times that are very quick. However, we still have people dying in Toronto. So response times is not the answer. 
The answer is early notification, making sure we have smoke alarms, and home escape planning, knowing how to get out. I, I think I interrupted you. We're going to tell us another story. Uh, no, I was just, oh. I have a video that might oh, even uh, better. put things into perspective. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Mayor. I'm not seeing any other questions. Did you want to go okay. ahead with your video? Next, next Thank slide, you. please. So this is a video that we did in cooperation with the Office of the Fire Marshal and our Fire Protection Advisor, uh, Brittany Kostoff. And it was, although there was a fire in this circumstance, we used the fire as a good news story because there's some information that came out of it, which we would like to share with you. We're standing in front of a house that was recently devastated by fire. Eight people, including four children under the age of five, safely escaped because they had working smoke alarms. Not all fires or emergencies have positive outcomes, but this one certainly did. Last September, this family visited our Fire Prevention Week open house and gained valuable information and knowledge on how to prevent, prepare, and escape their home in the case of a fire or an emergency. The message is clear. Working smoke alarms save lives. Having working alarms on every floor and outside all sleeping areas can help you get out in an emergency. As of June 1st, 2022, there have been 70 fire-related fatalities in Ontario. That includes children and entire families. Far too often, fatal fires happen when there are no working smoke alarms in the home. We're pleading with Ontarians, take fire safety seriously. Working smoke alarms save lives. That's Brittany Kossoff, much better looking than me. And I'm free to take any more questions. Thank you very much. Go ahead, please. Chief, if I could just um, maybe spur some more information. So you mentioned interconnected when we were talking about hardwired smoke detectors. I'm just wondering if everybody sitting here understands what an interconnected smoke alarm is. And um, there are still battery powered interconnected smoke alarms available, correct? So all is not lost if you don't have the hardwired is where I'm going with this. Okay, so hard, hardwired, they are powered by electricity, just electricity. Then you have hardwired with battery backup, uh, electricity with the battery backup in case the power goes down. Interconnected means that if one goes off, all the smoke alarms go off. And what was the last one question? Did you have any more? No, I just meant that, you know, I, th I think it's important to stress the fact that you may be in a house older than that 10 or 12 years that may not have hardwired interconnected smoke alarms. There still are options out there. Like it's not, yes. you know, you can, you can still uh, make it as safe as you possibly can. Yes, and actually in addition to that too, there are smoke alarms now that are battery powered that are, have a 10 year battery life which is a, a big advancement in uh, technology. So those are the ones where we had the session here with Enbridge. And, uh, you know, if you have those, you're usually, if they don't get taken down, you're in pretty good shape for 10 years. Go ahead, please. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, <coughs> Acting Deputy, I, I just wanted to make a comment and that was that you're obviously very passionate about fire safety and um, the fact that we have that we're benefiting from your expertise uh, from the Ontario Fire Marshal's office and your experience uh, in, in law enforcement and and in um, uh, and as a firefighter uh, we're very fortunate to have you here and I think um, I think the message is is really important for us to reiterate and that is uh, preventing the fire, helping people escape from the fire uh, so that when our suppression staff show up, they're just putting the fire out. They're not going in and trying to recover. Um, and that's the, I think that's the key message here. And, and I, I wanted to, to, um, to thank you for sharing your experience with us uh, and, and some of that motivation because I, I think it's, um, 
it's it's uh, an emotional time. It's very somber, um, and and it's hard to hear sometimes. Um, and I, I just wanted to say thank you for doing that. Thank you. Other questions, comments? If you had the ability to somehow get a smoke alarm to every house in East Gwillimbury, let's say, any idea how you do it? You've got to get boots on the ground and get to the doors and get inside those homes and ensure compliance. And that's what we're going to do. It's not a handout at the farmer's that, market? That's or one way, but then you don't have, once it goes out, you don't have that assurance. So Shauna's going to talk a little bit about how we track the information. Uh, but our goal is to get in. It's more about quality instead of quantity. If we go, we can leave information packages on the doorknob if people aren't home. But now we're going back to make sure that they got the information and that they're in compliance. Because then we can check them off and we're in pretty good shape for a period of time. We're still going to circle back and check those places, but at least we have it mapped out. Okay, we've done this whole area and we're 90% compliance. That's good. We'll go on to the next community and then we'll rotate through and have a schedule set up. And that's why we're so fortunate here because our paid on call staff and our full time staff, suppression staff, they go out and participate in the smoke alarm program. And they're very, they're getting better and better at it all the time. I'd like to be the model that everyone has one, and I'm just running this through my mind. I, I just can't imagine people with young children and other people living in their home and, and a, a smoke alarm that's not functioning. I, it, it just, it, it, I, I have no words for it. I, I can't understand it. You can get the milk and the bread and the beer and everything else to, to uh, the kitchen or wherever it's going to go, but the most important thing is the smoke alarm and they're not there. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other questions or comments? I'm not, I'm not seeing any at this time. Thank you so much. Really appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, and with that, um, Sean is coming up, aren't you? Thank you. Good evening, Madam Mayor and members of Council. I'm Shauna Davidson. I'm the Fire Prevention Officer and Captain of Education in the Prevention Branch. I'm responsible for seeing, overseeing the day-to-day -day operations of the entire branch. With the first line of defense, public education, this includes events such as school presentations, senior events, community events, station tours, and other community requests that we get from the public. For the second line of defense, inspections and enforcement, fire prevention includes any type of fire and life safety inspections. This could be new construction, existing construction, it could be an open air burning inspection, it could be plans examination, it, anything with respect to fire. I started my firefighting career in BC, British Columbia, working for Black Tusk Village, which was a total volunteer department. We didn't get one cent, but it, we were helping our community and that was what was important. Then I moved on to Whistler Fire in 1994. <clears throat> in 2000, I moved back to Ontario and worked with Springwater Fire as a volunteer firefighter. In 20, or sorry, 2003, I became a full-time fire inspector with Richmond Hill Fire and Emergency Services. Then in 2014, I had the privilege to come and work for East Gwillimbury as a fire inspector and a public educator. Since 2014, our education and prevention branch has gone from one lone soldier to the team of energetic staff who make each resident or occupant safer than when we found them. As a team, we are always looking to ways to get our messages out to the, resident, to the residents in unique ways. In 2016, we hired public education specialist Nicole Sprague. Nicole is a multitasker that is able to plan multiple events, find innovative ways on how to get our messages out to the public, and always has a smile on her face. In 2017, we hired Fire Inspector Derek Hill. Derek has an extensive background in enforcement from his many years in bylaw. In 2021, he was also able to attain his BCIN, which is a public, code, public building code in identification number status, to assist with plans review and building code inspections. 
In 2020, we hired a second fire inspector, Kelly Walton. With the addition of Kelly Walton, our branch was, was able to implement a progressive approach to our inspections to reach some of the properties that we have never been before. With the three lines of defense, education is our key with our branch and always looking for innovative ways to get our messages out to all residents, regardless of their age, being children, adults, and seniors alike. We engage all of our full-time career firefighters as well as our paid on-call firefighters and have representation at all of our events to spread the fire safety awareness and consistent messaging. Some of the events that we attend or host include Junior Firefighter, which we just most recently uh, hosted, Traveling Sparky, Farmer's Market, Junior Fire Camps, School Presentations, Dare to Care Events, McHappy Day, Skate with Sparkies, Senior Presentation, Station Tours, Charity Hockey Games, Chief for the Day, and Lunch with Firefighters. Our biggest event that we host each year in, is our annual Fire Prevention Week Open House. This is a vendor style event to engage our community partners to have education component with each facilitator. This is a hand-on event that shows the life of emergency services. As you can see from the slide, in 2022, we had a huge increase in events throughout East Gwillimbury. And this is primarily because of the many people that, <clears throat> sorry, many people are more comfortable with the COVID restrictions being lifted, as well as the demand for public education has increased. Next slide, please. This is a visual here to show you the interaction with the public. This is the number of people that attended our events over the last four years. Even during COVID, we were able to have interactions with our residents. Community Education and Prevention Branch has been able to partner with internal departments such as our corporate communications to assist us to use the use, the use of all social media platforms and reach many different demographics. Last year was our best year yet for community engagement. And with the addition of our own Twitter account, we have reached out to many, um, many people as well as all of our community requests that we've been receiving. Next slide, please. As we continue to expand our portfolio for events, participation for these events gets more complicated. Year after year, we're receiving many more requests for community engagement, which is fantastic. However, in some instances, the demand sometimes exceeds our resources. We're starting to feel pressure with trying to accommodate all of the requests, especially if all the requests are all, all for the same day. When we plan for an event, some take months to plan, where others can be thrown together rather quickly, especially if we've hosted or attended a similar event in the past. No event ever runs the same. However, at every event, we try to deliver the same consistent messaging to the residents of East Gwillimbury. Everyone loves seeing the big shiny red truck at the events, which is a huge draw. Having a career, firefighters as well as our paid on call firefighters at events is so incredible as we are so fortunate to have them to assist us in delivering our messaging to ensure that all residents have working smoke alarms, working carbon dioxide alarms, and having a plan and making sure that they're practicing their escape plan in case of an emergency. Next slide, please. Over the years, we've made some really great partnerships with Tiny Seedlings, Children's Aid Society, York Region Fire and Life Safety Educators, Lowe's, York Region Fire Prevention Officers Association, York Region Police, and York Region Paramedic Services. Some of the grants that we've been awarded have been from Firehouse Subs, Home Sprinkler Coalition, Enbridge Gas, Holland Landing Lions Club, and the Public Fire Safety Council, where they have graciously donated and helped implement public education programs. These partnerships help with the funding, the education materials, and resources for the various ages, age ranges of our audience. Next slide, please. In Ontario, every municipality must have a program that includes public education with respect to fire safety and certain components of fire prevention under the, protection, under the Fire Protection and Prevention Act. In East Gwillimbury, our program is our smoke alarm program. 
The smoke alarm program is a door-to-door -door program where our career and paid on call firefighters attend an assigned area to ensure that the residents have working smoke and CO alarms. As you can see, <clears throat> every year we're able to reach more homes. Our goal every, every year is to ensure that the residents have, are safe and that they have early warning with working smoke and CO alarms. In 2020, we made enhancement to our smoke alarm program by going digital from the paper, pen and paper days. This has been a learning curve for some. However, it's so great to have the information at your fingertips with just a mere click of a button. In 2021, in combination with our career and paid on call firefighters, we hired two summer students to enhance the smoke alarm program and assist with summer camps and events. As you can see, there was an increase. However, the homes that were accessed, meaning that we actually were able to get actually inside those houses, was only 543. In 2022, <clears throat> uh, in 2022, we had a dip in our numbers as a result uh, of our students helping with more public education events as the demands were greater, as well as the people were not, still not quite comfortable with us entering into their homes after the second wave of COVID. As we look at the numbers of the homes that we were able to attend versus the numbers we were able to access, our focus has shifted this year. Instead of going to a house and leaving education material that may end up in the garbage, we are now having our staff return in a different time or day to try and ensure that those residents have working smoke and CO alarms. This year, the goal is to have all of the homes that are assigned in each area to be 100% compliant. Next slide, please. This is a snapshot of our smoke alarm dashboard from our smoke alarm program that illustrates the houses that were attended in 2022. As you can see, there's a whole bunch of dots. The green dots are those houses that were attended and were accessed and have working smoke alarms, meaning the smoke alarms were actually checked and working. Orange is no answer. Red is refused and purple is no access, meaning that they physically were not able to get to the door, wh whether the road was blocked, there was, couldn't get down the driveway, maybe they had a bridge. Again, we just couldn't get access to their, to their house. What we're hoping for this year is to turn the orange and the purple to green. Next slide, please. The Office of the Fire Marshal has created a video to reenact a fire that happened in a home in Base Borden. The video clearly demonstrates how little time you have to escape a fire in your home and how fast fire can progress. It is vital that everyone has working CO and smoke alarms as well as having a planned escape and that you practice it. Ontario has an exceptional fire service, but fire and smoke can travel so quickly that despite their best efforts, firefighters might not be able to rescue you or your family if a fire occurs in your home. In fact, most fire fatalities occur when the fire department's response time is five minutes or less. What you are about to see is the actual recreation of a fire that happened in a home early one morning. Even though the firefighters arrived within three minutes of receiving the call, the fire claimed the life of a five-year-old boy. This needless tragedy devastated not only the family, but also friends, firefighters, and the entire community. What we've learned from this recreation, we'd like to share with you. It could save your life or the lives of your loved ones. This reenactment clearly demonstrates how little time you may have to escape a fire in your home. It drives home a very important message you must take responsibility for your own fire safety. As you are about to see, you may have less than one minute to safely escape a fire in your home. As lead investigator of this fatal fire, I determined the movements of the family. I also considered the amount of time for them to exit the dwelling. The building consisted of two semi-detached homes divided by a cinder block wall. Other than some very minor smoke damage, the adjoining home was intact. Permission to burn the adjoining home provided us with the unique opportunity to recreate this fire in almost identical conditions. 
we prepared the adjoining home to ensure the furnishings, temperature, and conditions reflected those in the destroyed home at the time of the fire. We then set up a fire simulation to test our theory that the fire had started in the wicker chair. But more importantly, it provided an opportunity to test the effectiveness of smoke alarms and the importance of home fire escape planning. In the destroyed home, there was only one smoke alarm located in the hall outside the sleeping area on the second floor. For this reenactment, we installed smoke alarms on both the ground floor and the second floor. We believe that the mother and the three-year-old boy came down the stairs and exited the building, followed by the father and the five-year-old. It's quite likely that the older boy became afraid of the fire and ran back upstairs. It's not uncommon for a child to react that way, which reinforces the need to hold on to your children and to assist them out of the home. We estimate it took 30 seconds to escape the dwelling after the activation of the second floor smoke alarm. That's a critical moment because when the family opened the door and exited the dwelling, the door stayed open and provided oxygen to the growing fire. What you are seeing now is the alcove area in the living room of the simulation home. The kitchen is on the right side of the frame and the front door is on the left. A fire is being ignited on the wicker chair, which was determined to be the point of origin of the fire. The equipment hanging from the ceiling are the heat sensors installed to monitor the temperature of the room at various levels. The smoke is now pouring from the ignition point and a small flame is developing. The wicker chair is now burning. Just take note of the time. The ground floor smoke alarm activates. Remember, there was no ground floor smoke alarm in the actual fire. The fire is still in its early stages, but you can see that the toxic smoke layers are already beginning to accumulate at the ceiling level. If the occupants were alerted to the fire at this point, they would have had more time to safely escape. In a fire, every second counts. There is no time to spare. The smoke alarm on the second floor now activates. This is the alarm the family heard. At this stage, they are getting out of bed, gathering their children, and preparing to escape. These are the fire conditions that the family would have faced as they came down the stairs. At this point, the temperature in the room at the shoulder level is approximately 40 degrees Celsius. Watch closely what happens to the fire conditions when the front door opens and more oxygen is introduced into the room. At this stage, we believe the mother and three-year-old are now exiting the front door. In the confusion of the growing fire, the father and older boy became separated and the father barely escaped with his life. Unfortunately, the child had run back up the stairs and perished in the fire. Within 30 seconds of the door opening, the temperature on the first and second floors soared to over 700 degrees Celsius. The fire is spreading rapidly throughout the room as flaming paint is dropping onto the furnishings. The room is rapidly approaching its peak temperature of 900 degrees Celsius. All of the materials in the room are now burning and in less than three minutes, we have reached flashover conditions. No one can possibly survive these conditions. You can hear the front window shattering. These are the conditions that the firefighters faced as they entered the burning building in attempts to rescue the young victim. Investigators from the Office of the Fire Marshal face these types of cases on a daily basis. The investigation of any fire fatality is never routine. However, the circumstances involving the death of a child are always tragic.
This reenactment clearly shows that you cannot risk having a fire in your home. However, tragic situations like this continue to happen across Ontario all too often. You need to do everything you can do to prevent a fire in your home. There are three essential issues that you need to address to protect you and your loved ones from fire. They are prevention, detection, and escape. Prevention. There are simple things that you can do to ensure that fire never starts in your home. Most kitchen fires result from unattended cooking, so stay in the kitchen and look while you cook. If you smoke, smoke outside and keep matches and lighters out of sight and reach of children. Alcohol is an all too common factor in many fatal fires involving cooking and smoking. Keep a close eye on anyone in your home who is drinking, especially if they are cooking or smoking. Keep candles away from anything that can burn and place them in safe, sturdy holders with glass shades. Blow out all candles before leaving the room or going to bed. These are only some of the things that you can do to prevent fires in your home. Detection. If, after your best efforts, a fire does start in your home, you need to know about it right away. Since this fire occurred, the law now requires working smoke alarms on every story of your home and outside all sleeping areas. The fire service recommends that you also install a smoke alarm in every bedroom. The early detection and warning of a fire provided by working smoke alarms can give you and your family the precious seconds you need to safely escape. Remember, it's the law. Escape. Everyone in your home needs to know what to do when they discover a fire or hear the smoke alarm. Most fatal fires occur at night when everyone is asleep, so it's important that you develop a home fire escape plan and practice it with the entire household so everyone knows all possible escape routes to get out safely. Make sure someone assists small children, older adults, or anyone requiring assistance. As this video has demonstrated, a fast, pre-planned escape is critical to survival. There are no second chances in a fire. Another way that you can greatly improve your odds of surviving a fire in your home is to install residential sprinklers. Sprinklers provide excellent fire protection because they can extinguish fires or control and contain them until help arrives. They limit smoke development and spread, giving occupants more time to evacuate and significantly reducing the likelihood of injury and death due to smoke inhalation. Sprinklers can cost as little as one to one and a half percent of the cost to build a new home. If you are building a new home, the fire service strongly recommends that you install sprinklers. The Fire Service of Ontario is working hard to keep all of our communities safe from fire, but we can't do it alone. We need your help. Adults and children are dying in fires that can easily be prevented. It's your responsibility to keep your family and your home safe from fire. For more information, visit the Office of the Fire Marshal website or contact your local fire department. Next slide, please. Within the Fire Protection and Prevention Act, we are mandated to do inspections of properties with respect to fire and life safety as a complaint, on a complaint and request basis at a minimum. Within the Town of East Guillenbury, ECSS has developed a proactive inspection program in addition to the minimum with the onset of the inspector that we hired at the end of Q3 in 2020. A complaint inspection would be from a resident or a tenant or bringing something, bringing a concern to ECSS, meaning maybe somebody has a basement apartment, um, somebody is doing something that they don't, they, maybe there's some hoarding situations, um, that would be a complaint inspection. A request inspection could be a license inspection for say a liquor license, uh, maybe a licensed daycare, somebody having an event where they're requesting us to come and do an inspection. Permanent inspections are those inspections that are for new construction, new builds, so a restaurant wants to open. Um, it could be an open air burning permit, it could be a firework permit, it could be an accessory dwelling. Uh, essentially those inspections that would require an, a, a permit for approvals for occupancy. The term vulnerable occupancy refers to any care occupancy, such as like a group home, a care and occupancy, uh, like a retirement home under the Retirement Homes Act. 
In EG, we currently have approximately 30 vulnerable occupancies within the town. Each one of these vulnerable occupancies requires an annual inspection. With a proactive inspection program, we look at our building stock to determine what has been inspected and what hasn't been inspected and use a scheduled timeline to, com to complete specific occupancies each year. For example, in 2021, we, ins we inspected all assembly and mercantile occupancies, such as restaurants, schools, basically the Young and Green Lane corridor. In 2022, we focused on businesses and personal services and mercantile occupancies, such as doctor's offices, shops, um, small, small uh, convenience stores, etc. Working closely with, we work also closely with our development services and our bylaw departments when we work with our permits and plans examination. Is there any questions? Questions? Go ahead, please. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Through you uh, to uh, to Captain Davidson. Um, the uh, the charts of the inspections obviously uh, ebb and flow. Is that because, uh, depending on the occupancy, they might take a little bit longer to, to do an inspection? So obviously, if you're going to come and do an inspection of an accessory dwelling unit, then a basement apartment won't take as long as uh, something like uh, a big commercial enterprise. Is that, Correct. is that why it sort of moves around a little? Correct. So that is one factor, for sure. Um, in t if you notice, in 2020, um, that was during COVID. So a lot of businesses were actually shut down. So we were able to get into 149 during COVID when nobody was letting anybody in. Then we had an increase in 2021 uh, <clears throat> with the onset of hiring another inspector. So in the 2021 year, we were able to do uh, many more inspections because one, we hired more staff as well as we were able, people were comfortable with us going in. Again, some inspections will take, could take a day to do some inspections you could do two inspections in a day however some more in uh, intense inspections say like an industrial build um, we could be there for days because of the magnitude uh, if you can imagine with woodbine one um, coming uh, that is a very large building it's going to take probably a week at least to maybe do a primary inspection and then you have your reports etc um, you know your research that sort of thing to go back and do your your follow-up inspections so some yes we could do you know if it's a strip plaza you probably could uh, do the strip plaza in a couple of days to get it all done whereas some other ones are going to take much more time and there's a lot of research that goes into those as well Other questions, comments? Go ahead, please. Thank you, through you, Madam Mayor. Uh, first, I want to say thank you very much for the invitation and the opportunity to visit the FESTI Training Center. I enjoyed that very much to see the new recruits in action and, uh, and also participating in the Junior Firefighter Day. Both events uh, uh, deepened my knowledge and appreciation and understanding of the training and the education that you, that you provide for us in the emergency services department here in, in East Coolenberry. Uh, my question is with regard to the junior firefighters. Uh, my observations, they had different stations, different activities, and, uh, and in the escape room uh, was, was really authentic. And so I could see it, there was very tangible um, results of learning from the children. And so are there ways that we can increase the number of children that we are accessing for educational purposes? Um, each of the municipalities had six children on each team, and there are nine municipalities. But are, do you have strategies and do you have plans for increasing the number of children that are educated? Thank you. Thank you. Through you, Madam Mayor. The, um, within the, the region of York, uh, York region, we only um, currently and up to now, we've only ever had six uh, students because it's a contest. So we open it up to the entire, um, all grade three students, and they are they have to fill out a, um, create a poster on fire and life safety. So it could be on water safety, it could be on bicycle safety, it could be on fire safety. And then through that, they are chosen, uh, six are chosen currently, uh, but definitely we, if we wanted to, um, I could bring that to York Region the Fire and Life Safety Educator Group to see if we can enhance that and, and make it more. But six, typically, when you have a, a leader 
uh, and a and a group of people, usually the ratio is one to six for you know one person. If we had maybe two educators to go around with them on the day, then maybe we could increase the numbers. But typically, when we deal with um, you know um, a, not a, sorry not a leader, but um, the group leader and the students, it's typically the six to one ratio. That's what we went with. A follow-up question through you, Madam Go Mayor. Ahead. Uh, and so, in, in terms of the weighting, though, where you focus your energies on education, uh, so with regard to seniors, adults, and children, what is the weighting, the in terms of your your efforts, the percentages, like the weight, the weighting of the percentages of those three areas, like seniors, you focus on seniors' education, or adults, or children. Um, which which one has the most weighting in terms of importance? I think the, uh, I mean everybody, if we could reach to every, every person, that would be ideal. We do have harder areas to reach. Our adults are our hardest um, group, if you will, to reach because again, um, as we grow up, we're sometimes set in our ways. We, it's never gonna happen to me. Um, so when we try and educate the children, um, they're, they're relentless because they go home and they're like, mom, mom, we gotta check your smoke alarm. They told us this at school, mom, mom. And so we're able to, to teach them young. And again, we have different levels of uh, education programs that we teach at different levels um, based on what they, their attention spans, et cetera. But when we teach them young, we hope that they're gonna adapt that if over and over and over again you, you understand and we reiterate the messaging, hopefully by the time they are adults, that then they will adapt those behaviors and make sure that they are safe. With the seniors, we, we continue, again, um, seniors, we found that when we educate them, they love having uh, an event. So an event over food, an event over free stuff. Um, so when we do that, and they like analogies. So when we give them a potholder and say, look while you cook, um, they're like, oh yes, that's a good idea. Or if they're busy on the phone when we're talking to seniors, um, we'll say to them, okay, if you're, if you're cooking and a phone rings, make sure you take your oven mitt with you or your ladle or something like that with you so that if you have to go and answer the door or answer your phone, you can remember, oh yeah, I was cooking and then go back to the kitchen. So again, different ways and strategies to, to educate different, all different age groups, but we tend to, um, Again, we try, we don't uh, discriminate at all. We try to uh, have an equal balance across. But this, we find with the children, if we can start them young, then hopefully they will adapt and take on those fire safety behaviors. Thank you. You're welcome. Councilor Roy DiClemente, go ahead, please. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor, uh, through you. I, um, I think that uh, the Junior Firefighter is a great program and it would be nice if, if we could uh, have more kids go through that program. I, I guess the best way to get to ensure that we get more kids through that program is to make sure that the province puts it, puts uh, fire and life safety uh, into the curriculum. And uh, you know that our fire services and our local municipalities can be partners with the education system to, to, to build it right into the curriculum so that we know that it, you know, and it, of course it's, it's uh, geared towards their abilities, but uh, throughout your schooling, that's just part, you know, just like you do uh, physical health and math and, and, and reading skills, uh, there's also fire and life safety skills. And I think that uh, that's an important message and perhaps uh, we can add our voice to yours. Absolutely. Other questions, comments? I'm not seeing any. Thank you very much. Thank you. Before I get started on the next section, through you, Madam Mayor, I'd just like to follow up with Councillor Johns on the residential sprinkler. Um, you, you brought it up and I think I skipped over it a bit. I just want to, it, residential sprinklers is a, is a great idea. We're not opposed to any other added level of, of safety. However, residential sprinkler systems are for their uh, uh, de uh, suppression system. They're not a detection system. So we don't want that to replace smoke alarms, early detection. That's the key. 
The suppression system is to put the fire out. We need to first avoid the fire from happening in the first place, preventing the fire. Then if it does happen, we want early notification. That's through smoke alarm. So that's that. S similar to a airbags in cars. There's airbags all over the place. We don't want the airbags to take over for the seatbelt. You still wear your seatbelt. So hopefully that helps a little bit in explaining that position. Uh, next slide, please. I'd like to talk a little bit about fire investigations. Fire investigations are extremely important, <coughs> so we find out what the fire cause was so we can prevent fires from occurring in the future and also to enhance any safety messaging that might come out of those fires. We have three qualified fire investigations, uh, Captain Davidson and uh, Inspector uh, Derek Hill and myself. Uh, we've uh, developed a new uh, peer review process to ensure quality and accuracy in our reporting. And we've also have a new fire investigation reporting template where we follow the scientific method, which is the approved process through the NFPA standard, the National Fire Protection Association standard for fire investigations. 1033 is the number. Um, the fire investigation provides us with uh, data to make informed decisions and planning uh, in regards to fire safety. Uh, the recent fire we had at uh, Deer Pass, which is the fire on the left, uh, we determined that that fire originated on the front porch uh, at a barbecue. And normally that would have been the end of it. Okay, it was the barbecue and we can't really carry on any further. So I was able to use my influence a little bit and phone the fire marshal and see if we can uh, get a forensic fire protection engineer on the case and see if we can determine what, what really happened with this barbecue so we can enhance some fire safety messaging here. And we did determine that um, this barbecue, it was a Napoleon bar barbecue. With this investigation, when we're starting to do this testing, we have to involve multiple stakeholders, uh, one being the OFM, uh, Technical Safety and Standards Authority, uh, two insurance companies, one for the homeowner and one for the tenant, and also representatives from Napoleon. Um, so we all work in conjunction because we all have a vested interest for fire safety. Uh, we are able to determine that this uh, barbecue, the uh, tenant was using an unauthorized adapter hose that he purchased at a Home Depot in Newmarket. And uh, he attached it to a 20 pound cylinder. And that overpressurized the, um, the barbecue and caused the fire and then ultimately caught the house on fire. So with that, TSSA got engaged and did a bunch of public service announcements. They actually followed up and went to the Home Depot and ceased the sales of these adapter hoses. So again, we're improving safety. Next slide, please. Another way we're improving safety in our community is through the community risk assessment. This is a requirement from the Office of the Fire Marshal. We need to complete this by 2024, and I'm happy to report it's going to be on time and on budget. Um, the on budget part was a joke. Nobody, had a tough crowd. Um, so our, our community, safety, uh, community risk assessment will focus on projected growth and inherent risks within our community. It's required to be reviewed once per year, so it's constantly being updated and reviewed to make sure it's current. Uh, the CRA will help us make informed decisions uh, on establishing baselines for service level needs. And some of the community profiles that would be considered, for example, are, are railways and waterways as being a potential risk. Uh, also our building stock as well. Uh, now, one of the ones I wanted to, to discuss a bit is, is Woodbine and how Woodbine 1, given the size, most people would think this mammoth building is such a high risk. 
but actually it's an extremely low risk. It's, it's low risk because of all the protection systems and detection systems it has, alarms, sprinkler systems, uh, building construction. It's actually gonna be a boring building for us, and that's good. <coughs> And next slide, please. I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, fleet and equipment. Uh, we are constantly uh, replacing and renewing our equipment, and one of them is uh, a replacement of a, of a tanker that's getting up to its uh, life expectancy. We have started the uh, tender process for that replacement. And we're also going to look at uh, some data from other departments that have purchased electric uh, pumper trucks and we will look and see how they are uh, doing with our Canadian winters uh, before we go down that road. Um, our annual certification for fire apparatus is quite intensive. It's uh, pretty expensive. It's probably about $10,000 uh, for one visit per year and what we've done is we've uh, streamlined our process with uh, going away from paper and we've gone to digital inspections for trucks and uh, deficiencies. We have introduced uh, live fire training. Uh, we just finished uh, two sessions, one with Central York and one with Georgina, our neighbors to the north and south. Uh, we utilized the OFM mobile fire training unit, which uh, provided our staff the opportunity to do live fire training scenarios in different environments. Uh, we are gonna try and get it again next year, but we're going to try and be the host and hopefully possibly set it up at the operations center and invite our neighbors to us. We've invested uh, six significant funds to upgrade the training and equipment for the confined space program. Uh, we've got a program for our officers and our acting officers called Leadership Essentials, which is a uh, program based on leadership uh, to train our, our captains. We've introduced an expanded blue card command to all our staff, and we have two trained and certified instructors. We've uh, created enhancements to our respiratory protection program. We have a fit testing machine that is ours and we can fit test our own staff. We also have uh, um, issued individual face pieces to all staff and we have installed uh, cab filters at all for in all first run trucks. We've installed iPads and all first run apparatus with uh, connection to tablet command, which is our incident command system. Next slide, please. In 2022, uh, we had a paid on call recruitment campaign that was um, assisted with our comms team, Daniel and, uh, Danielle and Rachel. Um, it was to hopefully highlight uh, the paid on call uh, employment and to in push the in importance of diversity and inclusion in the fire service and you know promote women and minorities into the service and that they're capable of doing this job and it's not just a male dominated profession. Uh, as part of this uh, recruitment program, they won a uh, MARCOM award, which is a pretty prestigious award, and uh, they're great to work with, and uh, they can take a lot of credit for the awesome group that we have currently on staff. Our paid on-call staff are fully trained and qualified and provide the flexibility to to respond when needed. We are constantly trying to improve our recruit training program. Um, we listen to suggestions from our current recruits 
and we listened to suggestions from our, our staff. And one of the concerns was that um, our staff were being trained and then they'd show up at the fire hall they were assigned to with a pager and nobody knew who they were. They were just these people, they knew firefighters. So they didn't know what they were capable of or who they were or what their names were. So now we've started to integrate them into the stations progressively throughout their training instead of just boom, right at the end. So approximately a quarter of the way through their training program, they're introduced to public education. They get a training course on that and they're actually able to attend public education events. Approximately halfway through their training, they're introduced to the stations where they can attend training nights and maintenance nights. So they get used to the trucks, used to the people, get introduced to staff and you know, it's not such a culture shock when they finally graduate and are able to respond to emergencies. It's been uh, well received and we're just constantly building on that. Our firefighter capacity at each sta station is uh, 30 at um, 24, station 24 in Holland Landing, 30 at station 26 in Mount Albert, and 20 at station 28 in Queensville. We are currently in the recruitment process for three full-time firefighters. Uh, we just had interviews today, so they're going very well. We have the second, uh, second half on Thursday, and then we hope to have the second phase uh, in the following weeks. And we hope to have them ready to go by Q3. Next slide, please. We have enhanced our uh, PTSD program by creating a peer support team. We have 10 staff assigned to this team with two coordinators. Our two coordinators are our trainers as well, and they are training our staff. And they will also be able to provide training to our staff so we won't have to go outside or do it through, um, you know, teams or something of that nature. We find that uh, the face-to-face -face is the best way to do this type of training. Uh, the initial rollout for this program has been very positive. Uh, supports are available to our teams, especially in high stress and traumatic events. Provide outlets for support for all staff. Uh, we've also increased benefits for our paid on call staff uh, as far as uh, health, dental, and memorial benefits. And this is uh, actually tops in the province as far as uh, the benefits package. And I'm happy to answer any questions on the topics that I just spoke about. Questions? I'm not seeing, you, you gave an excellent uh, presentation. Thank not you, seeing I'll Thank turn you. it over to Emily. Good to have you with us tonight. Thank you, Madam Mayor. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the town's uh, emergency management program. Um, so EG works closely and collaboratively with York Region and our northern um, six municipal partners, along with many other service providers and non-government organizations. Uh, so the Emergency Management and Civil Protection Act mandates that all municipalities have to have an emergency program, which includes a plan, a bylaw, hazardous identification risk assessment, critical infrastructure list, public education, training for staff, and an annual exercise component as well. So the bylaw and plan outlined the municipal roles, responsibilities, our objectives, partners, that type of thing. Um, and then one of the other components is ensuring an adequate public ed education for emergency preparedness. Um, in addition to all the regular safety messaging that comes from ECSS, Emergency Preparedness Week um, occurs typically the first week of May. Um, and we usually do lots of social media campaigns, um, participation in events, um, and other interactive contests to promote emergency preparedness and the need for the 72-hour preparedness kit for home and for your car. Um, our community education branch regularly reinforces this messaging through events, workshops, social media messaging, 
Um, and this year we participated in the Emergency Preparedness Week event at the Community Safety Village in Stouffville. Some of our beyond compliance items that we have also worked on um, include the business continuity planning program, as well as creating a new virtual EOC operating procedure, which I will um, talk to in a little bit. Um, I'm also happy to report that we did receive our compliance from the province uh, for 2022. Next slide, please. Some of the other main components of the emergency management program um, include the hazardous identification risk assessment, which identifies hazards um, with the likelihood and risk that uh, might impact our community. These can be identified by historical experiences or unique geographic and technolo technological features within our boundaries. Um, so for context, our top four in East Guilmbrae are infectious disease, no surprise there, uh, tornadoes, similar to the one that we saw last year in Durham region, Duresho, um, electrical energy outage, specifically in the winter months, um, as well as winter weather, extreme winter weather, and ice storms. Um, our critical infrastructure is defined as infrastructure that may be deemed critical if their failure or disruption may significantly jeopardize the safety and security of the community. So the annual review is also a collaborative project with York Region, and it identifies essential buildings um, and infrastructure in our community. So some of our critical pieces include our operations center, our civic center, our fire stations, and some of the community centers that also would work with emergency social services as um, evacuation facilities um, in the event of a mass evacuation or displacements. Next slide, please. Um, EG has also trained with compatible IMS structures in our emergency operations center um, and developing the competency and the capability um, in incident management system and the EOC operation cycle um, with the goal of being able to provide mutual support um, in the event of a cross-jurisdictional emergency or pro prolonged incidents um, in our municipality or another municipality, meaning a staff from here could parachute into the role of their counterpart in another location. Um, in recent years, the Northern Six Emergency Control Group members and the emergency operations staff came together for training um, for function-specific roles in a virtual environment. Uh, there was over 200 people, um, support staff and municipal control group members that attended these sessions. And we will be working with a similar training structure um, this year for our 2023 program. So last year we did a functional exercise called ransomware and we brought together over 27 participants um, from EG, including our control group staff as well as um, support staff. Um, this worked, it was a great opportunity as well to orientate um, staff new and old to the facility, um, to the operations center. And this year we'll be planning another exercise um, and have more staff participating. And so the last thing I want to highlight on this slide was um, throughout the last few years in COVID, most departments transitioned to a virtual environment and nearly all of the emergency operations center cycle meetings, all council, um, regular department meetings were in a virtual environment. So staff um, at the region in collaboration with the municipalities created a virtual EOC activation procedure um, to bring all the key players and all of the control group staff quickly <coughs> together um, in a virtual environment to do that initial situation size up and plan that first business cycle and action, action plan. Next slide, please. I just wanted to highlight a couple of the specific roles and responsibilities of council um, during an emergency event. Um, since this is a group effort, um, the mayor or acting mayor will act sort of as a spokesperson in coordination with the uh, emergency operations center director, the community emergency management coordinator, and the emergency information officer. This could be in the form of um, media releases, um, media interviews, or other avenues of um, networking. And depending on the nature and severity of an emergency event, um, the elected officials are 
responsible for a continuity of government, um, as well as activating specific legal procedures, which would be declaring an emergency or terminating an emergency. And COVID is actually the only time that we did do an emergency declaration. Before I turn it over to the chief to go over response metrics, did anybody have any questions? Questions? Very thorough. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Just about halfway through. <laughs> Don't you hate that line? We we practiced this earlier and it didn't take this long, but I'm I'm kind of thrilled. So um, next slide, please. Um, this is the home stretch. This is um, where we go through some of the response metrics and. Um, I look at these day in and day out and year over year and, and I, it, it makes me feel confident that, or it, it gives me a, a level of confidence to know that we're, 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 we're managing and we're doing the right thing and doing things right. So this one is just the last two years, a, a, a pie graph. Uh, it, this is the best way to illustrate the year over year the changes that could put pressure on our composite department. You can see the last two years, very little change in the, in the incidents. Like I said, as we walk through these, these uh, metrics and these data, it shows that we're effectively staffed with a composite model and able to deal with some of this, these, uh, with these incidents. Uh, next slide, please. So this is uh, the same graph or pie chart uh, six months into 2023, and you can see uh, no significant change. The majority is still medical calls. Um, 3% is fire, fires and, and, and people say, well, what, what does that mean? Is that blazing uh, structure fires? And f for those calls, we, Emily and I sat and we went through, um, for example, there's uh, eight brush or grass fires, uh, one small fire, an event that was extinguished by staff prior to our arrival, a smoldering garbage fire at Miller Waste, um, three car fires, a recycling bin smoldering at the end of a driveway, or an, an improperly discarded cigarette that's, that started a, a fire under a deck. So you can see that, I don't want to diminish the, the threat, uh, but you can see some of the stuff that we have, ha have responded to, but I mean, tonight there could be a significant event and that's why we, we, we have the level of staff that we do and the training that we have. Um, I like to think that I, compared to an, a rubber band, it, it sits there and it's inert and it, you know, it's not doing anything, but as you, as you engage it and stretch it, that, that's when we um, call on our staff, call on our paid on call staff, and then uh, call on our, our other resources for help. Next slide, please. Again, this is a little difficult to read. Just a cluster map that indicates the area of occurrences. Um, the blue, the significant blue are, are medical calls you can see down in the hall landing area. Orange are MVCs, or motor vehicle collisions. Uh, the grays are uh, the light grays are remote alarms, and the dark grays are other calls, other check calls. Red is fire. Uh, next slide, please. We have a couple questions. Oh, Can sorry. We break in now, yeah. or do you want us sure. to wait no, till the end? No, let's do it now. Just on the cl a clarification on the like again newbie, and you broke down all the different uh, the, the calls. The other is one fifth. So if it's not medical, it's not fire, it's not the motor vehicle. Could you just give me an example of another just so I can get my head around it? Sure. Uh, uh, other calls fall under the category of um, check calls, uh, odor investigation, um, non-emergency lift assist uh, to the um, uh, EMS people, um, and sometimes we assist police with, for various matters. Okay. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this, in, this one's important because it talks about some of the uh, outlier stuff that we do and some of the support that we have. Um, we, we talk about response agreements and we have, um, we have fire protection agreements, we have automatic aid agreements, and we have the, of course we have the mutual aid plan. Three, three different um, entities. The mutual aid plan of York Region is for when that rubber band is stretched and our, our, our individual, our East Gwillenberry resources are, are all maxed out, We've, we're, we're, we, we don't have anything in reserve. We simply ask for help from another department or from another area in the in the in the region, and and they send it to us, and it helps. And that first graph there illustrates for the last couple of years um, um, mutual aid services that we provided or that were provided to us. 
fire protection agreements are, are, are agreements that are based um, with a retainer and a per call fee. We provide um, fire protection services into King Township and into Uxbridge Township, and we, we pay for service from Georgina for a portion of the highway that they can, um, they can access a lot quicker and faster than us. Automatic aid agreements are, there, there's no money exchange for automatic aid agreement, but they're a wonderful thing where there's a simultaneous dispatch of two departments to one's area. Um, we have an automatic aid agreement with the town of Stouffville for the corridor, uh, the Davis Drive corridor, and one of the shared services that, uh, uh, topics that we're looking at with Chief Jenkins and Georgina is creating an automatic aid agreement through that uh, Ravenshoe Road area. Next slide, please. Okay, response times. Average response time is from the dispatch receiving the alarm to the arrival of the first apparatus for emergency incidents only. This is an historical or antiquated method of, of tracking monitor service, and I, I don't agree with it. Um, I think from our chart that we've shown you, response times should be taken right out, but this is a 40 or 50 year old uh, metric that, that, um, that just, won't seem to go away, but regardless, regardless, we're responsible to report to the fire marshals every year on this. So I'm going to I'm going to show it here. So we've taken four years, and you can see very little change. Oh, and I'm going to add this to the point because Councillor Foster had this question for me at um, the budget time. You know what? How how quickly does that second truck? This is just the first truck. How quickly does the second truck arrive on scene to support the crews of the first one? So in 2022, on average, the second truck arrived on scene within three minutes of the first truck. So, and I'm gonna throw the reminder in here. Unless staff are arriving in a minute or less, they're not making a difference in saving lives. We know that tonight. Early detection, early notification. Next slide, please. This one's a bit, um, a bit of a different view, but this is, uh, January to, uh, I believe, the end of May for 2023, and it's just showing it in a different way. Um, the vertical lines are the number of incidents dropping down to the representing the, uh, the time, the corresponding time. Yep. Go ahead, please. Can you tell us about the ones that are over 20 minutes? Okay, I was wondering if that would slip past. So, uh, <laughs> Yeah, Chief, what's going on? 26 minutes response time? So um, when we work with our firehouse uh, records management system, it, it, it's from the call time to the first arriving vehicle. So we, we know that. So what happens sometimes, um, for example, those, those increased times would be when we were providing uh, f um, mutual aid response into Georgina or down into Central York. Okay, so the, there's an increased um, time there. The, our policy or the procedure that we use is we don't send our full-time truck to the mutual aid calls. What we do is we page out our paid on call firefighters so they assemble at the station, they get a crew and they make their way down. So it's, it's, it's an extended time, it's an extended duration. So that's, that's one of the reasons why you see some of those outliers. It would be nice to see this chart for EG only to know when, when it's, so, so th those ones wouldn't be the first arriving, they'd be the first arriving EG trucks but there would be someone else already there. Uh, correct, yes. So I think this slide might be a little bit misleading that way, that nobody waited 26 minutes for the first truck. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, so if we could see this slide, uh, maybe you can uh, send it to us so we can see what the response time is in EG for sure. the first truck. Sure. Thank we, you. We certainly can do that. And some of the other longer response times, what happens is in this town, it's kind of an anomaly. I, I haven't seen it in the other two departments that I work for, but often, we get a call and then within a few minutes later we get a second call. So um, what happens is the full-time truck will be dispatched to a call, let's, let's say a medical call, then they get paged to a car accident. Well, the captain on the, the truck will make a decision to go to the priority call, which is good and correct, we, we trust them to do that. So that they'll get called off of that initial call and then the volunteer or the paid on call will get paged and then they go to that original call. So the time is elongated again. So that's, that explains some of those from there. Councillor Foster, question? Chief, it might just be, um, I think I'm right here. Some of these actual longer calls are not necessarily emergency response, correct? Uh, that well, might this, be worthwhile mentioning. 
I think this, if help me out, Emily, I think this was emergency response only. So yeah, it's all emergency. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Oh, and what happens also too is um, a call may come in that initially it is coded as an emergency, and then as as the uh, apparatus responds, the dispatchers get additional information. People on scene go, okay, I was wrong. It's not on fire. It's just somebody out back burning. So the call gets downgraded to a non-emergency response and that's, that makes up some of the others too. But we'll, uh, we'll, we'll circle back with that, that response. Next slide, please. Uh, this slide here just uh, compares yearly emergency and non-emergency incidents. That question came up during budget time too. What, how many how many non-emergency calls do we go to? And again, like I said to Councillor Johns, um, non-emergency we consider them you know smoke or seal alarm ch check calls. You know people will phone and say my smoke alarm is beeping once every 30 seconds. You know can you can you help me? Um, burning complaints, odor investigation, public assists, assistance to other agencies, and, and so on. Next slide, please. Yeah, I like this slide. This is the, the paid on call turnout time. So this is from the time from the dispatch center in Richmond Hill receives the call. Um, they process the call, they page out the call uh, to the pager on the hip of the firefighters and they stop whatever they're doing, get out of bed and get in their car, come to the fire station and get in the truck and, 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 uh, and move out. The time stops when the truck or leaves the fire station, they report that they're responding. So on average, it's five and a half minutes for our paid on calls turnout time. That's pretty impressive. Next slide, please. Of course, now we have to look at the turnout time for our full-time truck. So these the, these crews are contained. We've got them held captive at, at the station. The, this, again, the same thing from the time the dispatch receives a call to when they tone it out and the fire truck hits the front apron. We're, we're looking at just a minute and a half. So that's pretty pretty impressive too. Consistently. Uh, next slide, please. Um, often, you know, I'll hear nobody turned out, chief. Nobody showed up for that call, and, and well, we we consistently have a good turnout um, from our staff. Um, so you can see from this one, it's just the average firefighter turnout for the different the different varieties of calls or, or incidents. Again, over the three years, it's tracking relatively similar. Next slide, please. And this is uh, the final one, I think is just the breakdown per, by the district over the three years. If there's any questions, I'll Gladly take them, and if not, I'll turn it over to the deputy to close off the night. Thank you. Questions of the chief? I'm not seeing any. Thank you. Next slide, please. <clears throat> we have an attendance awareness program for our paid on call staff uh, because we want them to attend. We don't just want them to put it into cruise control once they get hired, so we have certain expectations for them. Um, we expect them to make 20% of all emergency calls, 75% of the training, and a minimum of 12 hours uh, per year for public education events. Mm -hmm. Most of our staff exceed the public ed education events, and we have a 82% compliance rate, so we're in good shape there and uh, our staff are very engaged. And in addition to that, I'd like to thank um, Council's support for being engaged with our, our paid on call staff and our staff in general, uh, but lately for attending FESTI, for example, farmers markets, the junior firefighters, it's, uh, it's a big deal. I know it, it goes a long way because I get comments from them all the time and it's all good. So they appreciate the support and we appreciate your support. We have a strong and cost efficient composite department that meets the needs of the community by promoting the three lines of defense. We are using our data 
to make informed business decisions for growth and development of the department. And we will continue to do the best job we can moving forward. And we are willing to take any questions across the board at this time. Thank you very much. Questions? Councillor Johns, go ahead, please. Thanks, Madam Mayor. Just uh, going back on that one slide there to uh, better understand the, um, so you have the, uh, the attendance awareness program and you called it requirements and then you said what the compliance was and 82% that's an A and like, but how do you know if that's good? Because if you flip the number the other way, that's 20% don't attend. And if we have 60 people that are um, working on this team, that's like 15 out of the 60 people aren't compliant. So how, what is the desire, how do you, how do you track what success is? Like 82%, is that good in comparison to uh, other composite departments or that of that 437 across the province? Like how do you know that that's good? How we know it's good is by the amount of response we get um, to scenes and to, uh, for training. So if we, if we get to these numbers, we're, we're confident that that's um, a successful number is over 80%. We have to be respectful of people's other professions as well and other commitments, family commitments, hours of work. We could have people that, we have a lot of people who work in the trades, for example, they may go out of town for a week. So they may miss a certain portion, right? So sometimes it will fluctuate uh, for certain individuals on their attendance. And it all happens on the number of calls that come in. They could be home for a week and make seven calls and then next week there's no calls <laughs> and so it, it does fluctuate and it's not an exact science by any means I, I guess what I'm getting at madam mayor I'm, I'm not saying that's bad that could we could be we could be in the top tier in the province I, I guess what I'm just wondering is wh what is the KPI like are, are you benchmarking that against the other composite departments in the province or no we can't because it's it's too there's too many variables right so so subjective because everybody has different numbers everybody has different if we were to compare ourselves to king king is volunteer so we don't have the same that they don't have the same requirements that we have plus they also have five times the number of, of staff too so it's very hard to compare ourselves in that realm because it's, we're a unique department. Sorry, one last follow-up question. Yes. So how comparatively are we year over year over year? Is that like that 80% holds? Are we, we doing better? Are we doing worse? How are we there? That's average. That's where we basically hold. Other questions, comments? Councilor DeHay, go ahead, please. Thank you very much to you, Madam Mayor. Um, with regard to your communication strategy with residents and the SAFER, the smoke alarm for every resident, uh, that's the right acronym, smoke alarm for every resident uh, uh, program, are there ways that uh, counselors can help in that communication delivery with regard to, for example, we have a, a Mount Albert revitalization public information session coming up on June 27th. Uh, are there materials that we can share with residents at that evening event? Or are there uh, materials that we can share as counselors when we're interacting with residents to help promote that program? Absolutely. Yes, we will supply you with any information you would like uh, at any time. Um, you can put it in your newsletter. Um, all that works and helps. And word of mouth is the best. You know, spread the word uh, because that communication really goes a long ways especially when it comes from an authoritative figure. Other questions, comments? I'm not seeing any. I just wanted to thank all of you for coming out tonight and, and uh, presenting to us um, as many times as I've heard it and others have. Um, I, I'm learning still new uh, things that are happening with the department and, and uh, 
and very proud uh, on behalf of all of Council, very proud for uh, the men and women that go out every day and um, at risk and give their time for East Gwillimbury and East Gwillimbury residents. Um, we see uh, you out at the farmer's market engaging children. I've seen you at a seniors event engaging seniors. Uh, and I, I just, we're, we're just very, very blessed to have such a terrific group of, of individuals. Um, when there's a call, they're there. So if you could please pass that along to, to everyone, how much we do appreciate all the good work that they're doing and, and thank them very much. Thank you. Um, I have a motion. Be it resolved that the Emergency and Community Safety Services presentation dated June 13th, 2023, entitled ECSS Council Workshop, be received. And I wonder if I could have Councillor Johns and Councillor Roy De Clemente. All those in favor? And that's carried. Thank you very much. I was going to say have a good evening, but we've re really kind of bitten into it for you now. <laughs> you, have to, you have to pack it up a little tighter tonight. Thank you very much. It was exceptional. Councillor Crothers just said she she uh, made a note to when she gets home to check her her smoke alarms and I, I don't know about anyone else but I have one <laughs> and and I think there's others as well it's a good just a terrific program to remind everyone yes if, if I could I probably should have said that with this when they were there but uh, I had a a bit of a grin on my face when they were talking about the school programs and getting through to to children yeah. Um, Back in the day when I was doing a lot of uh, Cubs and Scouts and Beavers and school programs and all that stuff at the fire hall, I used to make a practice of saying to the kids, go home tonight and don't go to bed until you make sure your parents show you that the smoke detectors work. Yeah. I got many calls yes. from <laughs> irate parents afterwards, but I thought that it, it did the job. <laughs> it was worth it. For one family, it was worth it. Thank you. Uh, wonderful night. Uh, we should do this uh, maybe once a year or in a, maybe a little different fashion, but, but excellent reminds everyone and hopefully we have it on an evening when we have a lot of people viewing uh, remotely that uh, would, would be uh, participating as well. Um, I'm at um, our closed meeting, we are to proceed into a closed meeting of Municipal Council, be it resolved that Council proceed into a closed meeting of Municipal Council at 7.54 to deal with the following matters. Personal matter about an identifiable or identifiable individual, sec Municipal Act Section 2392B, Council appointed committees, groups, applications, personnel matter. Um, could I have a mover and a second here, please? Councillor LaHaye, Councillor Crone, uh, all those in favor? And that's carried. So we'll wait a moment, I'm assuming. Yeah, yeah, just uh, one moment and we'll get us transition to a secure close.
Okay, we're live. Not we're live. Thank you. So uh, we're going to rise and report from closed meeting of municipal. Be it resolved that council rise and report from closed meeting from municipal council at 9:57 p.m. and that council endorse all directions provided to staff at the closed meeting of municipal council held on June 13th, 2023. Do I have a mover and seconder? Councillor LaHaye, Councillor Foster. All those in favor, and that's carried. Okay, and uh, Madam Mayor, there's just a resolution uh, that um, is up next for your consideration. Be it resolved that the seniors working group be suspended and that the status of the seniors working group be referred to the ongoing committee and group review process and that council request the executive assistant to the mayor and members of council to send a letter of thanks to applicants and recommend the members apply to join the 55 plus club. I have a mover and a seconder please. Councillor Carruthers, Councillor Cole. 55 and up. 55 and up. Plus. All right, 55 and up. All those in favor? And that's carried. Okay, and then uh, Madam Mayor, the, the next item, it can just be uh, one motion to adopt the three uh, bylaws, which would be establishing the uh, committees and groups for this term of council. So we have the three bylaws in front of you. Any questions on those three bylaws at this point? Seeing none, be it resolved that bylaw 2023-048 being a bylaw to confirm the proceeding of a special meeting of municipal council held on June 13th, 2023 be read and acted and signed by the mayor and municipal clerk. I have a mover and a seconder, please. Councilor Johns, Councilor Cruthers, all those in favor? And that's carried. And, and an adjournment. Sorry, sorry, Madam Mayor, you um, just skipped over one. Um, we'll just need one more motion for those uh, bylaws. That was a confirming bylaw. That was a confirming yeah. bylaw. Okay, so for the three bylaws moved by Councillor Roy De Clemente, seconded by Councillor Foster. All those in favor? And that's carried. We have a record, I think, tonight. <laughs> I'd have to look it up, but it's it's ten o'clock. Uh, Moved by Councillor Crone, Councillor Crothers, uh, be it resolved special meeting of municipal council adjourned at ten p.m. Um, all those in favor, and that's carried. I don't have my gavel here tonight, <laughs> but I would be smacking it. Um, <laughs> Thank you very much to everyone. It's been a long day. We have accomplished a great deal. I've kept a list of some things and not all of them, but we have, but, but we have recorded them. But what I want to say is that thank you very much. We, we've done an amazing job to look after our community today, and everybody was a strong part in it. So thank you, staff. Thank you, members of council. Go home and have a drink. Oh. Public service announcement.